Please welcome on stage Marco Becht. Uh, thank you very much. So it's my pleasure to uh, give a briefing on control enhancing mechanisms. Uh, and that actually brings me right back to the beginnings of ECGI because ECGI started in Milano in 70, uh, 1907, 1997, 98 with a project on the control of corporate Europe. And many of the contributors are here today. So for Italy, Marcello, uh, Bianchi, and Luca Enriquez wrote the Italian chapter. Uh, there were other contributors who are here today. So in some sense, we are coming back to the old themes. Uh, at the time, we were talking about, in Europe, um, pyramidal groups uh, and families. So we're still talking about families. We'll talk about them this afternoon. Uh, we are no longer so much talking about um, pyramidal groups, so some things have changed. And what are we talking about today when we talk about control enhancing mechanisms? Well, we are talking about um, one, uh, dual class shares. They've been around, uh, of course, for a long time. And then the new thing we're talking about is tenure voting, or sometimes referred to as loyalty shares. So the first thing I'm going to do is to go over the well rehearsed and well known facts about dual class shares. Uh, of course, tenure voting needs no introduction uh, in Italy, but I'll go over that as well, and I'll argue that, in fact, tenure voting or loyalty shares are a kind of dual class, except they're not dual class. Uh, and I'll uh, provide a comparison of the two. Um, I'll then move on to uh, a new frontier that's opening, which is that some countries that before were strictly one share, one vote, in particular Germany, are now have announced that they're going to put dual class on the books. That's new. Why is that? Uh, there's a new rationale for this. Uh, IPOs, I'll introduce that. And then finally, and I'll have to hurry up to get there, uh, I'm going to make the link with purpose and provide you with a very powerful new argument a why dual class, in fact, is uh, something you might want to put on the books to protect purpose uh, in a slightly different way than Colin Meyer presented it at the beginning. So let me get going. So first of all, what are the well-known facts about dual class? Well, if you have one share, one vote, which is the diagonal, um, then with 50% of the ownership, you get 50% of the voting rights. If you introduce a leverage of one to two, you only need 33% of the voting rights to get 50%, of the ownership to get 50%, and then you go down to eight, 0.1% if you have a 10 to 1. And then, of course, if, like in the US, you can go up to 20 to 1, with a mere uh, 4.8, you can get the 50%. And, of course, uh, when you then talk about what do people think about dual class, that's, of course, what institutional investors complain about. They don't like that. They think it's unfair, it's undemocratic, that somebody can have 50% of the voting rights with a mere 5% of the cash flow rights. So that's very well known. Now, the argument against that is also well known. The lawyers, and you know, we continue, I'm not a lawyer, but I, you know, I hang around a lot with lawyers, so I keep learning language. So this in the US is referred to as private ordering or freedom of contracting in Europe. So you know, adults can negotiate what they want, so as long as this is well disclosed, well, then people can buy the dual class. What's the problem? Now, um, of course, institutional investors are not happy with that. They argue that there's a market failure, they want these things to be banned and so forth, and there's a debate which I'll not go into. Now, the latest wrinkling, of course, is sunset provisions. That's what is boiling in the US. Uh, institutions want that to be mandatory. There's private ordering at the moment. Uh, Jill Fish is in the audience. She's written uh, at least several papers on this, summarizing the US debate. She's taken a position on this. Uh, so you can uh, also read up uh, on that if you wish. Now, the UK, of course, slightly ironically, has reintroduced or has, is now allowing dual class in its listing rules, but it's sort of like un-UK-ish, not really private ordering, but they say, well, you know, we impose the sunset, so you can list, but the sunset must apply to you, uh, which is not really private ordering. Now, one argument that has been also debated on this is, of course, index inclusion. Uh, and that, if you like, is if dual class is allowed in the index and you're an index tracker and you track a particular index, 
It's not your decision whether you buy the dual class, but you're forced to do this because the company, you are buying the index and therefore you're buying the company. Now, the counter argument is, of course, that today we have a lot of choice between indices and some indices exclude dual class, so why don't you track a different index? So the private ordering argument goes through there as well. So in comes tenure voting, now uh, also referred to as loyalty shares with tenure voting, except as the lawyers know, it's just one chair class, it's a statute modification. So if you hold the shares for a certain number of years, you then get multiple voting rights. So it's not actually that they are different shares in any way. And I've just given you one quote from France. Now, um, the thing about this is that beyond France, other people have put this, or other countries have put this on the books, notably Italy, um, but also uh, notably Belgium and Spain. Spain just put this on the books last year. What's been the motivation for this? Well, the motivation comes from the European directive, um, the directive as regards the encouragement of long-term shareholder engagement. So in Spain, it's the transposition of that directive. And you know, if you want to encourage long-term shareholder engagement, well, let's have loyalty shares, okay? That sounds plausible. Um, well, except there's a different reason for it. So how do loyalty shares work? Well, this is the case of one to two. So it's exactly like dual class. So again, with about 10%, you can get 50% of the voting rights, nothing different there. But what you'll notice here is that these downward sloping curves. So what's different about loyalty shares? Well, the difference is your voting power doesn't just depend on how many shares you hold, but it also depends on what the other people do. So you might very well have that leverage, but if the other people hold these shares as well, well, then you go back to one share, one vote, which is, of course, a selling point for loyalty shares. Um, now, does that work in practice? Well, um, no. I'll show you that in two slides. The first thing, however, that happens with loyalty shares, because the number of votes changes all the time, it becomes quite complicated because you actually have to compute the number of votes every time so you can work out how much voting power people have. And then you get things like this, this is from France, that you get notifications of how many votes, Luca Garavoglia is, is nodding, so I'll show Campari in a second. I mean, he publishes these things all the time. Um, so that's one difficulty um, that you have. Uh, the other difficulty is, of course, that you have to establish proof of ownership, and then in Italy, and I'm, I've taking the liberty of choosing we build, you then create a register, you have to register your ownership there. But of course, for institutions, that's difficult because the shares are effectively blocked, so they can't do that. So they can't avail themselves of the privilege of the multiple voting rights, which is you know, what purportedly one of the reasons is. Now, what's the effect of this? So I'm just choosing an example again here from France to be uh, polite. So if you take a long-term owner like BlackRock, so index tracker, they do not get the multiple voting rights, okay? Why? Because they can't block the shares. Um, so de facto, only the controlling shareholder can get the multiple voting rights, which is why de facto loyalty shares or tenure voting is very much like dual class, except it has all these complications uh, that I've just uh, outlined. So I am going to use uh, Campari as an example because Campari is, if you like, um, uh, an amazing example. So first of all, uh, it is an example of Centros or corporate mobility in Europe really working. Uh, so it's a, it's a transfer of seat to the Netherlands and essentially it's a proof of concept that today corporations in Europe can avail themselves of all the control enhancing mechanisms available in the Netherlands and that would be a separate seminar, what you can get there, but basically anything you might wish to have, you can get there. So the Netherlands is really the place to go uh, if you want control enhancing mechanisms, and the Campari example proves you can do it. Okay? So that's why I think it's really a very important case. The second thing is, of course, that this is really a triple distilled dual class, so it also shows you how you can push the system to going to not just from one to two, but from one to 10. And you do that in three steps. And then of course the effect is that you get exactly the same as you would from a dual class share system uh, with 
um, a one to 10 uh, leverage. And you know, if nothing is done, then you can either ha control 50% with 10%, or if you already have 50% ownership, you're going to go after 10 years, if nobody else buys the shares, to over 90% of the voting rights. Now, what's the, so that's, um, so uh, my argument basically is that, yeah, I mean, loyalty shares are not really about loyalty, they are a kind of dual class in one class, but unlike dual class, they are less transparent because they have all these wrinklings to them. Um, and in some sense, dual class is the more honest, transparent, upfront thing, which doesn't have any of these complications. But I think the panel will discuss why dual class, why a tenure voting might still be something that people prefer. For example, Luca Garavoglia told me a story about why Campari chose that particular structure, which he might elaborate on uh, during, during the panel. So what's the new argument here? Well, the new argument is that uh, politicians like to look at charts. They don't like econometrics, but they do look at charts. And this is a chart for, from a European uh, Commission or a re auxiliary report for the European Commission, which shows your IPO patterns in Europe. And you can see that Poland and Sweden have done very well in terms of IPOs, and Germany uh, and the UK have done very poorly in terms of IPOs. These are net gains and losses uh, from the stock exchange. Now, the UK responded by commissioning Lord Hill with a review, which then resulted in these uh, recommendations to allow dual class, albeit as a compromise with, you know, basically not being dual class because of the sunset. And Germany has just announced that they are also, Germany is going to reintroduce dual class. We don't quite know what the form is. Maybe Germany will actually reintroduce real dual class rather than the UK thing with the sunset. Um, and that would then, the idea is that that would attract entrepreneurs to list on the exchange. And of course, what people have in mind is Sweden, and I'm not showing that here, and the US, because everybody knows the dual class entrepreneur listings from the US. Now, note if you might have, um, uh, so I've, I've done this, so note you might have opened the Financial Times this week, and you might have seen that Porsche that Volkswagen is going to think about uh, putting IPO, but uh, Porsche back on the exchange to an IPO. It would be one of the largest listed companies in, in Germany. What's the control structure? It's not going to be dual class because it's not available yet. They are not planning to go to the Netherlands, but they'll do it with non-voting shares. Okay, so if you have a choice between non-voting and dual class, would you rather have one vote or would you rather have no votes at all if you're an institutional investor? Now, let me come to the link between dual class and ESG, and I hope that you've not seen this argument before, uh, so that it will be new. Uh, so this is a new powerful argument uh, in favor of um, dual class coming out of ESG considerations. And the starting point is a bit different to what Colin Kamaya said about purpose, because in, in Colin's vision, um, is a bit like Benjamin Franklin doing well by doing good. So if you just have the right management and you really understand your business model properly, by doing good, you're also doing as well as you can and you get the highest possible share price. Now, there's a counter argument which uh, comes from Hart and Zingales, which is that very often there's actually a real trade-off. If you want to do good, it's going to cost you some money. And for me, one example, since we are in Italy and I've lived in Italy for many years and I'm, I'm over 40, um, my very favorite ad from the Italian press, of course, from Italian TV, of course, is Altissima, Purissima, Levissima. Okay, and since I'm German, I can do a fairly good South, you know, Tyrolean accent. Okay, this is, of course, Reinhold Messner. If you've never watched this ad, please go to YouTube and watch it. Okay, it's probably the most memorable ad in favor of bottled water. And of course, note that this Himalayan uh, climber, he's climbed actually all peaks in the world. Um, what does he have in hand? It's not a reusable bottle, but it is a very nice um, Levissima plastic bottle. And in case you didn't know, Levissima is today owned by Nestle. Okay, so that's just a detail. Now, you also know the other side of the story, which is all the rubbish that's now on the top of the Himalayas. 
So plastic bottles are just not a good idea. Now, what is, so Levissima comes from a village in the Alps. It's actually fairly high up, 1,200 meter, meters. There's a spring there. How do you bring the water from there to Milan? I mean, a plastic bottle is a pretty efficient way of doing that. Now, if the company decided to no longer use plastic bottles, they would probably have to either build an aqueduct like the Romans, that seems unfeasible or expensive, or they'd actually have to use glass bottles. And that's going to cost you money. It's going to be expensive. So even if you can charge a higher price, that's not profit maximizing. Okay? Now, if you think this is fiction, people say that one of the reasons why Emmanuel Faber was ousted from Danone, because he wanted to ban Evian filling plastic bottles, and that would have cost them a lot of money. Uh, so there is a real trade-off here between a vision of not using something, namely plastic bottles, and shareholder value. Now, who prevents Danone and from Nestle from doing that? Well, you all know who is. In the previous days, it was corporate raiders and hostile takeover. Today, it's shareholder activists. Uh, and remember, both Danone and Nestle had a shareholder activist, a hedge fund activist, turn up at their doorstep and they're pushed on price. So if you do something that gets you far away from shareholder value maximization, a hedge fund activist will turn up and push you to change the strategy. They will take board control and they will force a strategic change to go back to value maximization. How do you prevent an activist from taking control? Well, um, you can adopt a control structure where you have more than 50% of the voting rights. Now, Hard and Zigalis then say, okay, and there we get to the families and Morton from this afternoon, if you're a family and do this, and this is going to cost you three billion, well, you pay half of the three billion, that's very expensive. If you introduce dual class, you only pay 4% of the three billion. So doing Paying the price for you, doing the, the price of pay doing good is actually much lower for you than it would be if you didn't have dual class. So this is a very powerful argument for dual class, except if you use dual class this way, you then get all the other issues that you import with dual class. So it's not that this is the sacred way out, um, but it certainly is a very consistent way for dealing uh, with these situations for enshrining a purpose that is not value maximizing in terms of shareholder value. So conclusion, so first of all, I think I briefly argued that loyalty shares with tenure voting are not the new dual class, but they're a sort of dual class. Um, practical problems can actually be overcome with technology. You could have a continuous counting of the number of shares. You could have an electronic register. So you could actually turn them into real loyalty shares or tenure voting, where also the Black Rocks of the world could get the voting power, but then it would not be dual class anymore. So maybe that's what, you don't want that actually. So maybe being old fashioned here is something that people actually want. Now then Patrick Bolton is in the audience. So Patrick has of course written a paper with Fred Samama on another kind of loyalty share, which is rewarding loyalty with warrants, so with cash flows. And that you can do in any case. You can do that for dual class, you can do that for one share, one vote. So don't confuse the two. Uh, loyalty shares with cash flow rights, you can do anyway. Now then, um, IPOs and ESG, um, there is of course a strong argument for putting dual class, if you believe in private ordering and you believe there's no market failure here, um, there is a strong argument for putting dual class on the books. Uh, not just in Germany, but also in other countries. Why only put loyal or tenure voting, but not dual class and give people the right? And in case that, um, as long as you're in the European Union, in case your government doesn't want you to have that, well, you can then talk to Campari and its lawyers and, you know, you can say, see you in the Netherlands. And with this, I leave the floor to the discussant and uh, I very much look forward to the panel uh, and the experienced business people who are, have experience with these control enhancing mechanisms and the questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Francesco Gianni.
morning, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to discuss uh, this uh, topic today. Um, also, I, I would like to give some thoughts uh, of the topics uh, from a professional point of view. So what we see in a law firm from a practical point of view regarding uh, these uh, uh, new instruments that we are talking about. Let me start, however, to say that uh, one of the most important changes in the Italian legal system uh, has taken place with the departure from the general principle that we had for decades, which was one vote, one shares. Now, we'll go through the way this uh, uh, change has taken place, uh, but it was clear that uh, the um, Italian legislator at the beginning wanted to link the economic risk to the governance of a company. So there was uh, a, a bias, let me, let me use this word, against the fact that uh, uh, minority shareholders or shareholders having uh, a small participation in the equity of the company would take control. Risk and control were to go the same path, in the same, same level, the same way. This uh, uh, general principle has been slightly eroded over the years. We uh, started to see, for instance, uh, uh, saving shares, shares that uh, uh, attributed uh, economic rights but limited voting rights to the shareholders, and then shares without voting rights, and then shares with limited voting rights, so voting rights only on certain subjects. So the criteria, one share, one vote, was uh, gradually reduced. However, the general principle that uh, the number of shares uh, that could be issued with limited or no voting rights uh, should not exceed 50% of the equity of the company remained. So at least 50% of the shares had to be given uh, to uh, uh, individuals who were uh, uh, risking uh, the, the capital and received uh, voting rights, which meant that by, you know, in the examples that we saw before, if you had 50% uh, voting shares and 50% non-voting shares, somebody having 25 plus 0.1% of the shares would have control of the company. That, that was uh, the first step. There was. These were the first steps to be taken. Um, in 2014, with uh, what we call the Creto Competitivita, the Italian legislator decided to take one step forward, and uh, the loyalty shares and the multiple voting shares were introduced. Um, there was a big difference that was, uh, was uh, uh, stressed by the Italian uh, parliament, the Italian legislator. Non-listed uh, companies could issue multiple voting shares uh, with a maximum of three votes per share. Listed companies could not issue at that time, and then I'll, I'll, I'll mention the exception, uh, and no, uh, multiple voting shares. But listed companies were allowed to issue uh, loyalty shares. Loyalty shares, as it was indicated before, um, were sort of linked to the um, um, holding time uh, of the shares by a shareholder. If you, held, if you had the shares for more than two years, 24 months, then you doubled your votes. So for listed companies, the system was a slightly less attractive in terms of control mechanism than it was for listed shares. There was a grandfathering clause, however, included in the Italian statutes that provided that a company that was uh, non-listed, that had already issued uh, uh, multiple voting shares, could be listed maintaining the uh, uh, multiple voting shares, but could not issue new non-multiple uh, voting, multiple, uh, voting shares. So somehow companies uh, where uh, companies with, were not listed uh, were allowed to take advantage of the system that they had uh, uh, set up during the time they were not listed, also at the time they were, not, not, uh, they were listed. Now, why was uh, the Italian legislator induced to uh, modify the system? But the main reason was that clearly uh, the uh, trend was uh, for uh, uh, companies uh, to choose uh, as a place uh, uh, of incorporation of the activity countries that had a more flexible uh, legal system than Italy. Uh, certain companies had already f uh, leaven, uh, le le left sorry, uh, the Italian stock exchange and 
started to be listed in, uh, in new stock, in uh, different stock exchanges. The Netherlands uh, is the main example. And the desire of uh, the Italian uh, parliament was to try to keep uh, the shares uh, into Italy, the companies into Italy, and the activities, uh, the headquarters of companies in Italy. Now, with the system that was introduced with the um, grandfathering provision uh, that I mentioned before, uh, 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 considering that, however, the um, provision that limited to 50% the shares with limited voting rights was kept in the, in the, in the books, in the Italian civil code, was not modified, you arrived at a position where, I mean, looking at the percentages that were mentioned before, if somebody who was already owning shares uh, with multi multiple voting rights in a non-listed company that was subsequently listed with 12.5%, plus one share could control the company. So that was a big change, a big cultural change from where we started, one vote, one share, now you would, with 12.5% uh, plus one share, you would uh, control the, um, the, 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 the company, the listed company, which was more important. L let me just open a small parenthesis. We're talking about listed company mostly today. All of us Italians know that, and also some of our foreign friends know that the Italian economy is not really made by listed companies, it's made by small companies with a totally different approach. So, you know, we are now limiting the, cons the, the, the considerations to listed companies, but there is another universe, big universe in the country, that are the non-listed companies that should be addressed, perhaps in a different, at a different time. Let me make a few technical uh, considerations, some of which have been made by Marco before me. Um, non, uh, multiple voting shares are a category of shares. They are shares, and they maintain their categories, their characteristics, uh, disregarding who owns them. Once they are issued, uh, except for the case of the listing company I mentioned before, once they are issued, uh, the party buying the shares will maintain the same rights of uh, the party who own the shares and sold them. Non, uh, um, so, sorry, loyalty shares are not a category of shares. These are characteristics attributed to all shareholders who behave in the same way. Shareholders uh, holding shares for 24 months, any, any shareholder with one share or with the majority of the equity issued uh, would benefit of the same uh, provision. So they would receive a double voting for the shares until they hold them, because when the shares are sold, then clearly the new owner has to start again the 24 months. So, and this is not a category of shares. And so they are, we're talking about two different uh, animals uh, from, a legal, from a legal point of view. Now, the reasons for the loyalty shares, why we issued loyalty shares, why, we, why the Italian parliament was, uh, was induced to do it has already been indicated. So I'm not going to bore you with uh, repeating uh, the same things that we, that we uh, indicated before. The, however, what I would like to, to stress is that notwithstanding the fact that um, these, uh, new, uh, these new features were included in, Italian, in the Italian legislation, Italian companies continue to look at foreign markets, at foreign stock exchange markets as their, their uh, objective, which means that perhaps the Italian system has not done enough in order to induce or, con or convince Italian, uh, Italian investors to, uh, or Italian promoters to stay in Italy. There are a few questions, however, that I would like to briefly touch regarding this uh, uh, enhanced uh, control mechanism that we are, we are discussing today. I think the first uh, issue that we should examine is uh, what criteria, what principles should prevail. Uh, it's more important to maintain a link between equity and governance uh, or it is more important to uh, um, foster stability of a company, stability of management? And I think the answer is not one. There are different answers. I think it depends on the uh, objectives of the investors. Clearly, if you are a promoter, somebody who sets up a company <clears throat> and uh, wants to grow the company by raising capital in the equity market, you would certainly be induced to utilize one of the systems. And, uh, with the grandfathering provision that I uh, indicated before, it is clear that if your objective is to go in the stock exchange, you issue 
non, eh, sorry, multiple voting shares at the beginning and you obtain the benefit when the company is listed. And with this 12.5 plus one share, <clears throat> by issuing 50% of the shares without voting rights, you would control the company. If, on the contrary, you are uh, a, a, a player in the market that wants to buy a listed company, certainly you would not be happy if the listed company had uh, multiple voting shares. So the two, the two uh, different uh, positions, the newcomer and the uh, potential buyer, have different views regarding, regarding the opportunity of utilizing uh, um, um, control mechanism in, in, in a listed company. Is, is uh, stability of the management an issue? I mean, we were talking about activists. Uh, sometimes the activists they want uh, to uh, invest in a company to obviously to modify the management, to review the business plan of the company, to uh, rationalize the company, and therefore they would like to change the management. And again, companies that have uh, multiple, multiple voting uh, shares issued that would render more difficult for the investor, for the uh, activist, or for any investor to change the management. If on the contrary you are happy with the management, you think that the management of the company is doing well, or that the business plan that the company has uh, uh, set up is uh, acceptable and you believe in it, then on the contrary, you would like to leave stability to the company. So there is not one issue, there is not sorry, one answer to which system is better. Mm, look, let's look also at it from the, not only the IPO, but also the uh, tender offer uh, aspect. How do you treat uh, company, listed companies that have uh, uh, issued uh, multiple voting shares? Do you, look at the equi do you look at the equity or do you look at the voting rights? The Italian system has clarified that you would look at the voting rights. So if by owning uh, shares that have multiple voting rights, you exceed the threshold because you can buy them, you exceed the threshold, or by acquiring loyalty shares, you exceed the threshold, and then you have a 30 or 25 percent, depending on the kind of company that we are, we are uh, examining, then you have to start a tender offer. So that, that, that is, I don't, know, I don't know, I'm not aware of how other systems are treating this issue, but Italy has clarified that you have to then start a tender offer if you exceed the threshold. Finally, one point that has been uh, uh, extensively discussed uh, in, the prior, in the prior panel and uh, by the, uh, the, the, the opening speeches uh, today. What should prevail uh, how, when we consider, uh, when we consider um, the introduction of uh, um, a control mechanism into company? What, do sh what should we uh, consider as prevailing? The interest of the shareholders or the interest of the stakeholders? I mean, my opinion, I share it with uh, what was said before by Mr. by Professor Meyer, I think that the stakeholder benefit has to be has to be uh, prevailing. Uh, a company is certainly uh, generating profits for the shareholders, but also generating jobs, technology, uh, you know, uh, many other aspects uh, in the life of a country that I think have to be taken into account. How do you do it? Then is difficult because, as I said, the balance depends really on the position that that the uh, investors would take. Um, in, as I said at the beginning, a few words on our experience. Uh, we, we work often with large companies, large investors, both financial and strategic investors. And our experience uh, in the last few years is that uh, the desire to have control um, enhancing mechanism is increasing. Uh, very often, for instance, when we work on uh, cross-border transactions, uh, Italian companies that uh, want to merge or acquire or, you know, have a business combination with a foreign company, the first question that they ask us is how do we protect stability? How do we protect, how do we protect the management? And the answer is you go to the country where those, uh, if that is what they want to do, you go to the countries where these uh, opportunities uh, are higher and Italy certainly today, even with those changes that I mentioned before, is not the most attractive, the most attra attractive jurisdiction. Now, the point is, the question is, should we do more? Uh, some of the speakers today said yes, uh, the Italian government should, should do more than, than it has been done today. Um, there was an attempt very recently with the so-called Decreto Rilancio 
to extend the possibility for uh, this uh, company to issue multiple voting shares. But that attempt aborted. I mean, the, 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 the law was not even voted. Um, the, 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 pro the proposal was withdrawn. And the reason was that it was seen more as an attempt to um, protect the country from the flying out of other companies than a mechanism that would have uh, would be meaningful from a corporate law point of view. I don't think this is the last mechanism, the last attempt. There will be others. There will be other proposals that will be presented in Parliament. I just want to mention that control uh, and control mechanisms do not uh, have to be seen as limited to issuing shares. For instance, uh, you could have a balancing between uh, the majority investor, let's say the investor who has already a controlling interest in the company for various reasons multiple voting shares or you know, the majority of the equity, and the, again, always speaking about listed companies, and the minority shareholders, the investors, the financial investors. Certainly, the, the voting list mechanism that we have in Italy is a very important tool that can be utilized. If this is seen also with the attempt to increase the number of independent directors, and the role of the independent directors into the company, not only in the board, but also in the committees, the remuneration committee, the related party committees, the nomination committee, you see that you could, uh, on the one side, allow somehow uh, uh, the shareholders who doesn't own the majority of the equity to have a controlling role, but on the other side, you have a balancing weight, a balancing role that you can give to financial investors. Final comment, uh, and it was already mentioned, so I don't, I'm not going to spend much time on it. The harmonization of the systems in Europe uh, has to take place at the European level. Uh, if we don't uh, see an effort by the uh, European uh, Parliament uh, to introduce uh, legislation that will be then adopted in the, in the various countries that somehow create similar rules, the competition between countries will continue and will not end. So it, it is a run that never finishes. You, you don't know how much you have to go further in order to be more attractive than another country. That is why I believe that um, an effort should be made uh, by us, you know, by, by people involved in, this, in these matters, to uh, create sens sensitivity at the level of the European Union and see whether some step can be taken. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage the moderator of session two, corporate control, Chiara Mosca, together with panel participants, Luca Garavoglia, Massimo Ferrari, and Andrea Vismara. Uh, good morning. Good morning to, to all of you. Uh, I am grateful for the invitation to this conference uh, and honored to chair this, uh, this session. Uh, I found uh, a lot of inspiration from the opening presentation of Professor Becht and uh, um, Avvocato Gianni. Uh, the, they focus on the main challenges related to corporate governance, uh, uh, corporate democracy, and the market of corporate control. From my point of view, uh, very important, the implication with the cover law has been mentioned, and also uh, the mandatory offer consequences in case of multiple voting structure. Uh, now, in this section, uh, we will focus more, more on this control enhancing mechanism, uh, tenure voting or loyalty shares, if you prefer, and dual class structure. Um, as has been said, there are significant divergences uh, uh, in Europe and worldwide on the possibility uh, to adopt uh, a control enhancing mechanism and multiple voting. Uh, in Europe, this is due, uh, first of all, because of a lack of harmonization, of full harmonization um, in company law. 
and does uh, also the listing rules uh, play, uh, play a role in these divergences. Uh, in some EU countries, uh, the introduction, the adoption of uh, multiple voting structure uh, has been on the agenda very, very often, and uh, uh, it gained uh, uh, new attention um, very, I mean, periodically, let's say. It has been mentioned, 2021, uh, the reform of the listing rule in the UK. We all remember 2014 in France, uh, the country moved from the pre-existing opt-in regime for tenure voting to tenure voting as a default rule. At the same time, Italy introduced tenure voting for listed companies and multiple voting for private ones. Uh, departure from one vote, one share principles also in Spain, 2021, and Belgium, 2019, in the form of a reward for loyalty, two votes for each share. So, basically, we know that uh, a lot of discussion has also been made from the academic standpoint. Uh, years ago, at the time of the introduction of the Takeover B Directive, we have, lot, we have been discussing extensively uh, of dual structure as very powerful poison pill against takeover. Now, it seems, apparently, that we are moving to discuss more tenure vo uh, voting because they are a lighter tool, a lighter control enhancing mechanism, mainly because they are not permanent. Uh, uh, we can introduce sunset clauses uh, to, uh, uh, to stop the effect of the multiplication of voting rights. But we are, for, we are also going to see uh, tenure voting as uh, devices to enhance sustainability, long-termism, and engagement. So basically, there is a lot of open questions, so I'm sure that you are going to contribute to the discussion uh, today. So basically, welcome again to you, uh, Luca Garavoglia, uh, Andrea Vismara and Massimo Ferrari. And uh, I have basically common questions for you all. And I would like to organize in this way the four questions, uh, seven minutes each for, uh, for the answer, and then the same rule for the second round. OK. So um, the, the first, let's say, group of questions uh, is about the specific reason that supported the decision in your companies to adopt multiple voting structure, and probably uh, even most important, which was the reaction of investors during the decision pro process when it was announced and afterwards when, for example, uh, double voting matured. And second, uh, I'm also interested in knowing with, uh, which one are the instruments that can be used to ensure that multiple voting are used to uh, increase the reach uh, of sustainability goals, long-term value creation, instead of uh, extracting private benefit of corporate control. Thank you. Luca Garavaglia first. I'd say, first of all, the need for a decoupling between ownership and control has always been there. There is nothing new in that respect. And even if we take the Italian example that uh, also Avvocato uh, Gianni uh, talked about, even when the rules were not there, you had two very powerful tools in that respect. One was saving and privileged shares, and the other was the pyramid groups, which no longer exist, but at the time that was clearly a way to get a control enhancing mechanism. Uh, I very much believe that tenure shares are just a CEM nothing more and nothing less. Uh, the reason why tenure shares has been so successful is that tenure share is one of the ways to get to a, a, a de facto double voting class shares without a tender offer, essentially. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, the principle is the parity of treatment. So when you want to move from a one share, one vote situation to uh, a double share, a double class share, you need somehow to, uh, to cross the border. And in order to do that, tenure shares work, because essentially you give the possibility to have tenure shares to all the shareholders. And therefore, only by time, you mature the, 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 the controlling situation. Uh, one other way to do that, uh, which is highly inefficient, uh, has been, for instance, followed by Mediaset, 
Mediaset, instead of uh, going for the, the tenure share structure, uh, in order to respect the parity of treatment rule, gave one privileged share and one ordinary share to whole shareholders when they mo uh, relocated to the Netherlands. That uh, has two uh, very big disadvantages, and that's the reason why we chose not to do that. The first one is that you have, at that point, a double listing. So you have two shares listed instead of one, and of course that is very detrimental to, to liquidity. And secondly, uh, uh, you cannot actually forecast uh, what, uh, uh, what sort of premium will be given to mm. uh, the, uh, let's say, multiple voting shares. And in theory, in a, in a company like Mediaset, with a stable controlling shareholder, the premium should have been minimal. And when we, uh, we thought about going through that route, which we eventually uh, decided not to do, we estimated that the premium should be in the region of 5%. And if the premium was small enough, uh, then the controlling shareholders could sell the, no, the lower voting shares and buy the higher voting shares. In reality, media has showed that uh, the premium has gone up to 40%, which is uh, economically uh, totally unjustified. But if that is the case, that means that uh, for the controlling shareholder, offloading the lower voting shares in order to increase the, the higher voting share can cost a, a fortune without a real benefit. To more specifically answer the question, uh, in our case, of course, the reason was that we wanted to grow, and in order to grow, we, we needed to issue equity, and we wanted to issue equity without losing control, because we w there is one decision we cannot compromise on, which is appointing the CEO. Uh, we have uh, the vast, vast majority of our wealth uh, embedded into Campari, and we can simply not accept uh, that the CEO is not chosen by us. Uh, uh, th then the CEO must be independent. We are very much against the family having a managerial role, but uh, in, uh, uh, in the world you see a lot of CEOs that are perfect from a CV standpoint and in, 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 in reality are square idiots. So we don't want an Indra Nui becoming CEO of Campari, that over our dead body, to, to mention names. Uh, the investors have actually reacted very positively, or maybe very neutrally, in the sense that um, uh, we can hardly see in 20 years of uh, history of, of the listing uh, any correlation between the depth of the control enhancing mechanism and the appetite for, uh, for, for uh, the share. Uh, ultimately, the price is solely dependent on uh, uh, performance and on the, the, situa the contingent situation of the market. And there I believe that, you know, intelligent shareholders know that uh, uh, once control is not uh, there, it's not effectively uh, up for sale, it doesn't really change whether control is exercised with 50% plus one share or with a control enhancing mechanism. So you have two different kind of companies. You have a company, public company, where control can th theoretically be bought. And then there is, of course, let's call it a speculative premium. And you have other companies where this is not the case, and the speculative premium is not there. Uh, that the fact that the control is then exercised with uh, uh, one way or another is not so important. Thank you so much. The second answer, Andrea Ismara. Thank you. Um, well, in the case of Equita, uh, the uh, choices were made uh, for different reasons. Uh, Equita is a small cap, is a, uh, it is an independent investment bank, uh, and it's a people's business. It's a partnership. So uh, there's no individual controlling shareholder, but it's a, it's a bunch of managers um, who are joined by a shareholder pact. And obviously, They've been selling shares in, in the past. Some of them get out of the business. There are new ones buying shares. So it's a dynamic shareholder base to a certain extent. Um, and um, anybody who uh, would want to invest in a firm like Equita would certainly want to make sure that the management, who are the people really creating value for the business, are uh, clearly uh, in charge. 
um, because it's, it's a people's business. That, you know, that's the nature of the business. So when we got listed five years ago, we got listed initially on the AIM market. We couldn't use loyalty shares because technically it was a non-listed company, so we adopted multiple um, uh, voting shares. When we then transferred less than a year later to um, uh, the star segment of the regulated market, then we uh, changed to the loyalty shares. And because we also um, assist investors and research, you know, publish a lot of research on companies, so we have a pretty good um, uh, observing platform on, on the market. Before we did that, we observed what had happened after 2014 in Italy, because a lot of, lot of companies had actually moved to uh, loyalty shares in particular, because that's what could be done by uh, listed companies. And to be honest, uh, to date, uh, uh, even now, there's no evidence that institutional investors left. If we actually look at the um, shareholder structure of companies, before and after, it was pretty much identical. And some of those companies did really, really well after uh, moving to the loyalty shares. Um, to date, also, I cannot say that there is evidence of um, uh, malpractices linked to uh, uh, loyalty shares. Um, multiple voting shares, for all the reasons that have been discussed, are very limited in Italy, because frankly, going through the effort of uh, issuing multiple voting shares for three to one instead of two to one, it's just more practical to have loyalty shares. Um, but again, there hasn't been much uh, abuse of that. Um, I must also say that I haven't seen uh, many acquisitions that have really created that much value for shareholders um, and benefiting from the fact that um, the core shareholders had um, loyalty shares and therefore double votes. So I think it's been, it's been something that has been successful and that hasn't really changed much, but gave comfort to controlling companies, controlling families that they were in charge. And the same was to a certain extent for management um, uh, controlling equity and for investors investing into, into equity. Um, so I think that's a, a very important point because there's always a bit of a, a starting point that these, these enhancing um, control, controlling measures somewhat uh, create the reasons for people to abuse their position. There's no evidence. In Italy, we've seen a lot of evidence of abusing Chinese boxes, as they were called in Italy, which were holding companies, controlling other holding companies and controlling other holding companies. We, we all remember savings shares that were described by Avocato Gianni, which have always created very little um, additional value for uh, <coughs> the holders of those savings shares compared to the others. Um, so loyalty shares, to, to, you know, at the end of the day, have been pretty good for the market. How can they be offset by other initiatives uh, to make sure that they're not abused? Well, th there's plenty that can be done. Um, we all comply with a very strict corporate governance code, which is very um, wide in, the, in its scope. Uh, we in Equita have a majority of independent directors who obviously are in all committees. Um, we also incentivize ourselves as managers um, in strict relation to our ability to achieve certain business plan objectives and a certain value creation for our shareholders. And obviously, when it comes to uh, responsible capitalism, we are very focused on ESG, we establish our foundation. I won't go through all the things that we have done. So I think um, when, when I heard uh, before, I understood the logic, but um, let me tell you that uh, hearing that uh, long-term perspective could effectively generate opportunities for managers to take decisions which were good for the overall community but bad for shareholders, it gave me the creeps a bit because um, it's one of those things that we have seen in Italy. We have horror stories of long-term investors such as banking foundation destro destroying value um, through the banks that they controlled. Um, so we have to be very careful about that. Um, I think shareholder value must always be one of the uh, important components of the overall balance of how a company is run. Yes, thank you. This is an important point. And also I found uh, very interesting the experience uh, 
of uh, moving from double voting to tenure voting because the theory generally says the opposite, uh, that multiple voting is a benefit for, for, of private companies that can be kept after the listing. So we are expecting to have companies with multiple voting during the IPO to keep this mechanism. Instead, they can turn and change and moving from the multiple voting to the tenure voting, which is also uh, interesting to, to, to know about, about that. So, and... Um, Thank you very much. Yours. Uh, let me start with a preliminary consideration uh, on uh, uh, some of the thoughts embedded also in the speech made by the professors uh, before and uh, from Franco Gianni. Um, we, we, we asked uh, ourselves uh, about uh, uh, loyalty shares, multiple voting shares, starting from uh, the market point of view. I would like to spend some more words uh, in the second round, uh, but I believe that we already are in the scenario made by Franco Gianni before, uh, that the stakeholders uh, weigh much more than the shareholders. We have the same standards, the, st the same request uh, asked from customers, from uh, workers, uh, from suppliers, uh, than the one that we think come from uh, the institutional investor or the minority investor we will discuss later. Uh, so, because we are discussing uh, uh, of the competition of different uh, system, uh, and the answer is the answer made by Mr. Garavoglia and uh, by Asonime, we need uh, a sole unique regulation in Europe, we need a most powerful uh, regulator uh, because uh, otherwise we respond uh, uh, to other news, uh, other opportunities uh, in, uh, I don't know, in, if in, in a proper way. When we introduced the, the loyalty shares, uh, is, it was the same time then uh, Fiat uh, took the decision to move uh, the headquarter in Netherlands. And uh, so we, we never stop the, the, this uh, competition about different system uh, inside Europe, of, of course. Uh, moving to the we build experience, uh, we introduced the, the loyalty shares uh, during uh, a restructuring deal uh, made uh, in order to save uh, the second player in the infrastructure uh, segment uh, and uh, uh, involving uh, some public entities like CDP and the major Italian banks. So uh, it helped a lot uh, to balance the dilution for the majority shareholders because we made a capital increase that uh, double uh, the number of shares. And uh, the second point, as uh, Mr. Gianni told before, there are many different uh, uh, considerations to put uh, in, uh, uh, in this uh, field. Uh, we wanted to align uh, the interest of all the shareholders to a business that has a very long span of life, because to build an infrastructure, with the exception of the Genoa Bridge that was uh, at the end an easy and small infrastructure, takes many years. So we would like to have uh, more investor with the controlling uh, uh, shareholder and with the, the major um, also um, managers, the, the top manager of the group uh, for the, the, the longer period we can. So we didn't have, uh, as uh, Andrea and as Equita, any negative feedback. Uh, we have uh, uh, inside the register 
some long-term investor. Uh, we didn't have uh, any of the classic investor like, uh, I don't know, Black Hole, Black Road, Norges or, or Vanguard, but we will discuss later. I would like uh, to give you also some uh, figures, uh, some numbers on that point. Yes, thank you. And I think that now your, your opinion that we need uh, a solid and unique regulation in Europe with regard to this company, Law Matters, can allow us to move to the second group of questions. And then you are very good in managing your time, so probably if you want to add some consideration, uh, uh, we, we may maybe have some minutes. So, the second group of questions uh, is about, uh, uh, about jurisdiction and the role of Europe, basically, because uh, we, uh, we, we have said that uh, uh, there are a lot of discussion in Europe and time to time jurisdiction are reconsidering the approach toward multiple voting. Sometimes they say, can you uh, allow more flexibility where multiple voting exists uh, to, to modify the multiplier to vote in three voting or even more? Or sometimes they are still deciding if they want to introduce multiple voting. So what I understand for, from the discussion here is, is that you consider uh, multiple voting a valuable tool, and I share your view. You also said uh, a lot of time balancing. You said that corporate governance may balance the risk, <coughs> and of course a lot have been done in corporate governance regulation in the last decades, so this is also a good point to address. So going to my question, the question is, what do you believe must be uh, the approach? Uh, if member jurisdictions are reconsidering because they want to increase the attractiveness of markets and um, uh, they all, also they want to announce uh, the attractive, not of the single markets, let's say, but to the markets in Europe, because we know there is a decrease of the assets to capital market, and of course there is an internal competition. Uh, what is your view about the policy uh, uh, device? Let's say initiatives at the <coughs> national level or at the European level. I can imagine the right answer from some of you, but if you can uh, develop a little bit more on this, thank you. Uh, you know, first of all, it's important to acknowledge that, for instance, in the Netherlands, tenure voting don't exist. So, <laughs> it's not that the Netherlands was uh, uh, particularly attractive because they had a tenure vote uh, uh, discipline. The Netherlands is simply free. And as I was saying, the reason why tenure votes were, were somehow invented to go to the Netherlands is because they are the only practical way to bridge from the, uh, let's say, one share, one vote, even evolved in the, into the uh, uh, so-called loyalty shares, into de facto a double voting, double class share. So I very much believe that uh, initiatives should not be at the national level an initiative should not be uh, towards a precise and strict and rigid discipline. I very much believe that uh, we should leave uh, a total freedom to issuers to do whatever they want under the principle that uh, I, I am a firm believer of, of the rule that in financial markets you can also sell rotten eggs provided you declare it. So the, uh, you, you have to be total freedom, but to make some example of how the devil can be in the detail, essentially the Italian law was uh, copied uh, after the French law. The French law is the loi florange, and uh, the Italian law was exactly the same with two relevant differences. One is that uh, in the loi florange French system, you have an opt-out mechanism. So double voting applies to everybody unless you choose the contrary. And the second very important difference is that uh, when the La Loi Florange was introduced, uh, the, there was a temporary exemption, exemption of the mandatory tender offer rule, which was not the case in Italy. And to tell the truth, uh, and this is something I can affirm because I was part of the group, uh, working group at the time, the only reason why the Italian regulator in, uh, was in favor of uh, the loyalty shares was because they thought that the Treasury could then sell stakes in Enel and Eni at the time, keeping control. The fact that uh, uh, there was no exemption for the mandatory tender offer, in fact, uh, um, 
force them not to do so because they would have, since they have a 30% stake, they would need to calculate very, very carefully the, the maturing of the voting rights not to incur in the so-called OPA di consolidamento. So this shows that rigidity is not the answer. On the very contrary, I think that uh, uh, the uh, society is a uh, society in, in the sense of a company is a nexus of contracts uh, and contracts should be free to the maximum possible extent. Yes, thank you for mentioning the mandatory offer because uh, uh, it's a very technical but fascinating topic and of course uh, the difference in France was the exemption, one year exemption while in Italy we didn't have a similar one, uh, was left to the secondary regulation mainly to develop uh, takeover rules. Uh, this has been done uh, in a very technical way, but with some consequences on the market, of course, because only where, when the corporation were already above the triggering threshold, they were safe uh, that they can uh, uh, increase yes, the, the practical multiple. consequence was that companies with a shareholder above 50% could introduce loyalty, loyalty oh, shares because mandatory, trigger offer, mandatory offer would not be triggered. Yes. A companies where shareholder would have between 30 and 50 or even below 30 could not because exactly. th then you would incur in the, in the mandatory tender offer. Yes, exactly. Um, <clears throat> before I answer your question, I go back to your remark earlier on of um, you know, how um, intriguing it was that we gave up our multiple voting rights and, and chose to go for loyalty shares. Uh, and I wanted to make, you know, again, reiterating what uh, um, Mr. Garavoglia said, that flexibility really should be in place. In our case, we don't have BlackRock uh, because we're not large enough for BlackRock to be there. Um, we could open a whole debate as to whether passive investing is great for the market or not, but let's leave that aside. In our case, we have entrepreneurial families, for instance, that are happy to be together with the management in our shareholder base. Uh, in May this year, we actually uh, broadened our shareholder base involving a number of entrepreneurial families. Some of them were very pleased to uh, apply for the loyalty shares um, and to get a double vote in two years' time. So in, in our situation, um, loyalty shares effectively uh, are very different from a typical multiple voting right, which would be stuck only for certain individuals and not open to others. So I think you know, different type of companies, different, different objectives uh, lead to different uh, decisions. Um, going to your question as to whether these things should be addressed at European or, or um, Italian level. Um, well, we all wish they could be addressed at European level, obviously, because uh, we, they would uh, get us off the hook. Uh, but I have been part of... Uh, European groups uh, analyzing this, uh, and I don't think these particular issues like multiple voting rights w can be addressed in a uh, way that is mandatory at European level for countries to adopt. Uh, when we looked at this, and we looked at this very thoroughly in the context of the, the test, the stakeholder group that, that addressed these issues last year, uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, the European Commission could give guidance could give indications that it, it was a good thing for countries to adopt, but it, you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, company law co that, that is uh, uh, specific to every country. So whereas I totally agree with the fact that there should be one regulator to avoid those to, to, you know, type of regulatory arbitrages, uh, then we always have to uh, um, realize that uh, company laws are different in different in different countries and therefore we have to do our homework and we have to look at our company's law and realize that it's, it's, we're lagging behind, it's not competitive with other uh, jurisdictions and that uh, relates to multiple voting. We have to look into uh, uh, um, quorums uh, to call shareholders meetings, we have to look at minority protections, um, we have a very comprehensive corporate governance code that is highly protective of investors. So we should be looking at, at, at all of these things and act at national level, not waiting for uh, Europe to take initiatives on this. And we should do it sooner rather than later, given that um, we have also realized that being part um, uh, of a larger um, um, stock exchange network as Borsa Italiana is today means having access 
to different markets, different jurisdictions, different pools of investors uh, that open inevitably to a regulatory arbitrage. Why should somebody who has their corporate headquarters in the Netherlands be subjected to two regulators, uh, the, the Dutch regulator and the Italian regulator, if they can be listed uh, only in the Netherlands. So we have to get our acts together in Italy first um, and then hope that uh, Europe will follow uh, by strengthening common regulations through uh, the empowering of, uh, of ESMA, first of all. Yes, of course, uh, even from the uh, double point of view of company law and market law, the, the topic is very complex. I see your point. Uh, and you also reminded basically the, that ownership structure still, uh, is, still is important a lot in taking the decision and in shaping uh, uh, voting rights and governance. Uh, Mr. Ferrari, thank you. But, um, I obviously agree with what uh, they already told, so I do, I do not repeat. Uh, what is very important uh, uh, from my side uh, is that also from uh, the European perspective, uh, we have to be, uh, to have very clear the priority. In my, uh, in my opinion, uh, the multiple voting shares are not the priority, for instance, for the Italian market. We are uh, hosted by the Borsa Italiana. I uh, would, would like to give you also to the uh, professor coming from uh, uh, abroad, uh, some figures. Uh, in the period from 2002 to 2021, 185 company, companies were listed and 20, 278 companies were delisted. In the last 19 years, uh, the Milan Stock Exchange had lost roughly 180 billion due to the listing in terms of a market cap. Uh, another important point, uh, uh, the level of the very low level of household savings channeled into the domestic change and bond market. Uh, since the start of uh, 2000, Financial assets held by Italian households uh, have grown by 2.200 billion to approximately 5.300 billion. Of this amount, roughly 30% continues to be invested in foreign currency or deposit. Uh, only 2.5% uh, are invested in non-financial Italian companies. Uh, we have seen uh, the international stock markets uh, have undergone profound transformation in recent years with a change in operator and the market dynamics. Uh, and I do not think we cannot ignore that. Uh, the percentage of passive investors continues to grow uh, just to give you an, an idea, in Europe, uh, exceeding 32% of the assets under management uh, in uh, 2021. In addition to the growing importance of these passive investors, including uh, uh, the already mentioned uh, BlackRock, uh, in the 10 last years, the stock market have also been transformed by the developments of new technologies. So the increase of algorithm trading uh, and uh, all the other uh, high frequency trading that according to ESMA account for 80% of the total trades made on European markets. Uh, we know there are the the so-called dark pools. I would like, uh, from the European perspective, uh, if how would we have to approach this uh, uh, source of liquidity, source of risk, uh, also considering the change in the global environment coming from the war, coming from the change and the dramatic increase in the energy price. And then, uh, Interesting for the control of the companies. 
most of the decision coming from the institutional investor come from the proxy advisor. More than 92% of the decision taken uh, by the, in the General Assembly are totally aligned with the decision taken by the proxy advisor. Which kind of model of control, which kind of processes uh, are they following, who uh, regulate them, these are, in my opinion, questions that are much more important in this environment uh, than the multiple of the loyalty uh, shares vote. Yes, thank you for your warning. I think that uh, you are right. We are facing the emergency of capital markets, development of capital markets in Europe and in Italy. So, um, of course, the point is that multiple voting, very technical, very interesting for some co corporations, less from others probably, is a technical issue, but it's not. I mean, you still have to keep in mind the overall picture of how market works. Uh, so, thank you to everyone, and thank you very much. there is nothing to add. Thanks a lot.